announcements. Uh, so this coming week, uh, weekend, the 18th, um, is the first step uh, pregnancy centers walk for life. And I believe there's still sign up forms up back. And if you have any questions regarding that, if you want to help out or uh, sponsor, um, Penny is up back, back row, and she'll, uh, she can answer questions. Um, and then uh, June 5th, uh, Mom's Morning Out. Uh, it'll be at uh, 9 o'clock again on the 5th. And this is a time for mothers that have young children to receive encouragement and fellowship from other, mo for, from other moms. And this is kind of a funny one for Betsy and I because Brian almost misread this one time and said for young mothers with young moms. And Betsy comes to this and she's not a young mother. And so it, uh, anyhow, so she kind of stands out. Well, that's great. Um, so then another reminder on the pig roast and baptisms will be on July 27th in Nick and Jody's. Um, so save the date. It's a great time. We have a lot of fun. Sometimes there's some injuries, but it's still fun. It's still a good time. And so I encourage you to attend. And then um, uh, growth groups. We... Uh, the, we're in our third week, and the bookers, I believe, I guess they're up back. They have room for, I don't know if it's one or two more uh, folks. Um, and then the Finnemores and the Williams, correct, you have capacity in your small group too, and you guys are meeting in Bangor. Okay, so could you raise your hand? I know you like to be singled out, okay. So anyhow, if you're interested... Check, go talk to those guys. I really encourage you to do it, uh, to get involved in the growth group. It's, um, well, it's just biblical to get together and dig into the word and, um, you know, pray for one another and, and get involved in one another's lives. There's, there's some great friendships that are, that are built there and truly building the, you know, the relationship with brothers and sisters. So uh, will those who are... Gavin, tithes and offerings, please come forward. Yep, I'll get that, Nick. That's the next one down. Um, so uh, let, it, let us pray. Father, um, as always, we thank you for a new day and for another time to, to gather as brothers and sisters and to dig into your word. And um, so, Lord, here we, we, we give back what you've given to us in... Uh, Lord, we, we do it with a happy heart because you have blessed us with so much and you take such good care of us. And Lord, we ask that you would multiply uh, these gifts to further your kingdom, Lord, and to, to minister to those in need. In your great name we pray, amen. Um, and then also, before we get started, those who need a Bible, please raise your hand. And uh, Nick, come assuming we'll get you one encourage you to grab grab a Bible. Keep me on track because I can uh, wander. Um, and then also, Mark, is it true you guys are moving like this week? It is. So that's different than we talk. We leave Wednesday. Okay. So Mark and Joanne are headed to Texas. And um, I know last we talked, you weren't sure. Did your house sell? Is it? Uh, it did. Well, good for you. There you go. Getting it done. Always gets it done. And, uh, so I guess, let's, let's, let's pray for them as well. Um, Father, we lift up Mark and Joanne. And, um, Lord, we know that they're moving to, to be with family. And, Lord, that's so fitting with what we'll discuss today. Lord, to be there to help, to just enjoy those times with uh, the grandkids and their kids. Um, Lord, we pray for safe journey. We pray that uh, you would make it as easy as possible. And Lord, uh, we thank you for the time uh, that we've had with them and how they've served and, and loved on us. And Lord, please lead them to the place where you would have them serve next. Lord, where they would continue to use their giftings to, uh, to bless you, to glorify you, and to bless others. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. So, once again, it's Mother's Day and I'm teaching and it's not easy, to be honest with you. I know your mom's like, oh, it's real easy to do this. But I look at all you guys looking back at me and like, what do you know about motherhood? And it's a very legitimate question. It's, uh, but 
Michigan will will do our best. Um, and it's you know, and it's challenging in that we've you know, Mother's Day isn't always a happy time for people. There there are some folks who don't have kids, can't have kids, and those things. And it's and it uh, it can be a heavy day. And and I, I don't know what everybody's situation is, but. Uh, Please, please, please don't be burdened by that. Please be able to, to glean and uh, out of this, in um, for the for the sake of, of the mothers who were who are in the fight. Um, and it, as I was considering the past two years teachings, it's when they talk to the people, it's always like, oh, bring out the tissues. And honestly, that's not my. That's not my intent when I do this. I know I end up crying, and it's never my intent. It's moms. It's to. <laughs> it's um, um, it's to encourage moms. You guys carry a tremendous weight. I mean, the, the realities of motherhood is it is tremendous, and and I was told last time that it uh, it was depressing, the teaching, and that wasn't my goal either. But I I had. I listen to oh, so many mom podcasts and it, it, like all the stuff that moms chew on and deal with it in, in, in their minds, the way it's, it was really to, to, to encourage because so much of the battle is in the mind that, and it, uh, that, that certainly was not my intent. And, um, but this Mother's Day is a little, it's going to be a little different. I think it's going to be heavier, um, <laughs> not depressing. Hopefully, but no, and I, I, uh, my, my heart is heavy for moms, and of course, I, I, I watch my, my bride, and, and how she's raised our kids, and, and I observe many of you around here, and I marvel at the energy that you still have. Of course, I know if I would ask you at any time, you'd probably say you're tired, but it, it all, all that you're able to do, and um, we, we were at the weekend to remember we were at a, a, a couple of weeks ago. They use this analogy of the difference between how men and women think. And they had women, like, like this radar dome, and it's just always going around and taking in all kinds of stuff and processing it all at the same time. And just going around. And then men, we're like this. <laughs> right? We've just got this antenna, right? And it goes around and so wives right are coming at us with all this kind of stuff and like we can only handle one channel like if you start we can turn the dial and we'll get the antennas dialed in okay let's talk about this um and so with that it's it's uh i just find i when I, when I try to consider all that you are processing it exhausts me and it overwhelms me and but your day-to-day that that's what's going on, the weight, because you see things that we don't see, that us guys, and I, I know I've talked about this before, you are so dialed in, and you are, you, you're keen on things that the, us guys, we're, we're just not there. So, you guys, a tip, pay attention to your bride, because they generally have what they call intuition, where they, they, they've just got more coming at them and receive it. Um, but with that, there's, there's, I feel there's a lot of weight. And then this, the pressures of this world, the expectations of this world, to try to live up to something that's, it's not realistic. And it's, frankly, it's not what God's called us, called you to. Um, and so, and even, even the role of motherhood is, is really under attack. You know, those of you who are champions for your kids and you sacrifice so much um, in modern society, you know, that's not seen as, as, as honorable, I guess, or whatever. But there's just a lot of things going on that... Um, I think feed into your, your, your hearts and minds that make it uh, more difficult. Um, so this, the society that we're in, 
adds to that. Right? We talk about expectations and we can look around and we can see things are going in a way that aren't good. Right? Things are upside down, they're backwards. What was once loving and caring is now seen as hateful. Right, and and as parents, it's very hard to navigate that because, and we'll get this into this more. But truth, uh, they keep trying to move it along, move it along. But truth is truth. Truth is not an opinion. Truth is a person, and it's Jesus Christ. And that's our benchmark. But this, the, the war rages on around us, and um, our society, our society is in a in a rough spot, in a tough spot, it's in trouble. And uh, moms, you play a key role. So, hopefully I don't make you cry, if I, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, if, you're, if there's conviction, ponder it, take it to the Lord. Um, but I guess more so, I hope to tap the warrior in you, that this is, you, you're in a war. You're all pretty and you do all these fine things, but you're also built to fight. So, moving along here, I, I, I always struggle with what to teach. And um, I, I read a lot of things, I listen to a lot of teachers, I do a, a lot of things trying to go, Lord, what is it that you would have? And of course, I've been teaching through first Philippians, I mean, uh, Philippians. <laughs> Um, for one, I guess it is the first one, but, uh, um, but, uh, in, you know, verse one, Philippians four says, therefore, my beloved in long for brethren, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. And that, that stand fast is what stood out to me. So I chewed on that, chewed on that, chewed on that. What, what does that look like? What does stand firm? What does stand strong? What does that look like? And, uh, you know, stand firm in the Lord. You know, how do we do that? And I was led to Daniel. And, you know, his, his taking a stand, right? He had purposed in his heart not to defile himself. And so... And in that he was able he was able to stand, and so that led me in that direction. I mean, I was reading Genesis two and three about the fall and the effects of sin, and Balaam and his uh, talking donkey, and it was all over the place. The Ephesians and the there's an awesome prayer in Ephesians that uh, Paul has for the church. I'm like, man, what a cool prayer for our kids. Um, anyhow enough of the glimpse into my mind it um, yesterday I was trying to put this all together I just got notes 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 and I was just praying God you got to give me something like what is for today um, so anyhow when I get done praying I, I have a an email um, devotional that I read in the mornings and it was Daniel 1 8 so that is why we're here today and hopefully you guys can get something out of it. And I believe that was confirmation. That's, I don't get those all the time. To I me, mean, that, that was kind of a cool, real quick answer. And uh, so anyhow, before we dig in, I need to pray again. Father, um, as always, I, I pray that you would speak through me and that these words would be yours. And Lord, that our hearts would be open to what it is you have for us today. And please speak to me clearly as I tend to stammer. And uh, tough to carry a thought. But Holy Spirit, please work through me and do what it is that you want to do here this morning. And it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus, my King. Amen. Okay. So moving right into Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles in the house of God, 
which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, if you're looking for a name, anybody, it's pregnant, this is a nice name, um, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. And I know for a lot of us this is a very familiar story and it's very easy just to read over it. Um, but let's, let's pause for a second about what's happened here, right? There, um, these young men are being taken captive, right? They've been taken from their homes, been taken from their families, um, and to an own unknown future, right? Though they should have known, right? The Israelites should have known this was happened. The prophets warned and warned, right? That this is this is going to happen because of the way they lived. Um, so they're being pulled uh, from their families, from their friends, from what was familiar. familiar. And uh, surely they wondered, where's God in all of this? Right? They, didn't, they didn't know the end of the story like we do. We know what happens in these guys' lives. Um, and, and I guess before we move on, you know, are we asking the same thing? Or is there something... Is there something in, in your life that's going on that you're asking that same question? Is there a hardship? Is there something that, God, where are you? This isn't supposed to be, you know? And as we'll learn, it would seem that these young men were faithful, yet they were still suffering the consequences of a uh, rebellious nation. Um, we know that in this trial, right, and all this heaviness that's going on that some of them right will defy the king and um, stand against his decree and will survive the fiery furnace right and we know Daniel he'll do the same he'll defy the king and he will face the lion's den and we know that Daniel and we get given the gift to interpret dreams right which altered the course of things for King Nebuchadnezzar. Right? And that Daniel would prophesy that he would write a book that speaks of what we live about today. And it was born in hardship. Right? As, as we talk, you know, today we call it trauma, or traumatic things, or whatever. That's what happened. He stayed the course and was used and it's affecting us today. And so there may be something that you're dealing with today. There might be hardships in your life. God's sovereign. Nothing goes to waste in God's economy. And so um, hang in there. Seek him. Because he, uh, he can use us all. Um, so I guess moving on to... Uh, we're back to uh, verse 4. So they took young men in from, well, I'll just read it all again. The young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve the king's palace, in whom they might teach the language of the lit in literature of the Chaldeans. And again, the king appointed for them a daily provision of his delicacies, of the wine which he drank, and three years of training. So at the end, they might serve before the king. He was grooming them to be ambassadors. Um, and so he took the best and the brightest, you know, and, uh, to glean. And that's, to me, it's a comfort if this would ever happen. 
I wouldn't be taken to Babylon. I could, at least I'd be stayed at home. But uh, it, um, I don't know if it's King Nebuchadnezzar or those around him, but are very, very smart in what they're doing. Um, right, they have a, basically a systematic way of brainwashing and deprogramming their subjects. Right, they... Uh, You know, they're going to teach them the language, right? And uh, we know that that's, you know, to, to assimilate, you know, to learn the language is, um, that's the quickest way to do it, right? Jump in and uh, learn the language and you, be, you pick up on how they live, how they talk, right? And we, we can do the same even with our own conversation with who we hang out with, we can pick up how they speak or vice versa. And so they assimilate them into the culture and teach them the literature. And in this case, right, it would be paganism, right? Uh, Babylon is known for that, just a wicked, wicked, vile place. And so he brings them in to teach them all those things and trying to change their minds, trying to change the way they think. Um, and then he would f serve them his food, right? And we know from the Levitical law, there were certain foods that they, they could eat and were the foods they were to stay away from. And so, but in this, by pushing this food on them to try to move that along, to make that go away, and you could see that it would be a fairly, it'd be kind of an easy thing to do. One, it might be some really good food, but you're in this foreign land and probably scared, don't know what's going on, and it would be very easy to, to compromise and allow that to go. And we know that one compromise leads to another, leads to another, until the conviction is gone. And so, um, so that's what they're doing, right? And um, totally sh shifting, you know, the, the, their mindset, uh, grooming them for the ways of Babylon. And then as we continue reading, we'll see that they were pushing to change the way they worship. In, and in this, by changing their names. Right? In verse 6, it says, Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And so, the, as we read here, their, their Jewish names had godly meaning. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to change that. So in Daniel's name, means God is judge. And so in, in his name, that, that, that would be the, the understanding. And his name is changed to Belteshazzar, which refers to the prince of Bel. And it means, Bel, protect my life. And um, so in that name choice, switching it, or trying to influence Daniel to call to Baal as opposed to Yahweh. And Hananiah means the Lord is gracious. What a cool name that is. Huh? That's a really cool name. Um, and it changed his name to Shadrach, which refers to the sun god, Rock, which means to be illuminated by the sun god. And Mishael means who is what God is, who is like God. Meshach refers to a pagan god, Aku. His name means who is what Aku is. So again, just switching that, switching that. And Azariah means the Lord helps. His name was changed to Abednego, meaning a servant of Nebo. Again, another false god, another uh, pagan deity. So in this, right, so they change the way they, the way they think. They change, the, pursuing the heart, change the way they live, and changing the way they worship. And as, as we pause, 
Does this sound familiar? Does it sound like today? Right? Because we have a world system that is doing just that and has been doing it quite effectively if we're really going to be honest. Right? The, to speak of the Bible or to pray in public or in the schools is a big no-no now. Right? The government has pushed it out and we, we've seen the the consequences of that. Um, and just in the public square, it's shunned. Right? And we think for any of our kids, if they were to stand up, or for any of us to stand up, yeah, yeah I believe in God. You, you looked at as a as an idiot. You know? And, um, and so the world has moved that, right? So our, our society has become very secular, right? In, our, in the world view, right? It's a secular world view is the times that we live in. And you know, you can, they kind of push like this relative truth, you know, you can believe what you want to believe, and um, you can believe in a God, you, you can be whatever, you can believe in a Jesus, but it's your Jesus, because there's no, like, r real Jesus. Um, and uh, so, like, you know, the in some aspects, of they'll allow for that, but for most part, for, you know, secular humanism, it's, is to replace God. Right? You've got the anti-Christ, you know, anti meaning, you know, against, but then anti also means replace. And our society has replaced God, right, with this, that they, they believe that we humans are the center, right? So secular without God, humans... Um, humanism, we are the center. Like we, we, we determine what is good, what is pleasurable in life, and really have control over our, our, our destiny. And um, so that's what's been fed to us for several generations now. And, and with that, you mix in evolution, right? So we got humanistic evolution, which again is pushing this God part out, right? And so, we, we, it's a total shift. God is not allowed, though the theory of evolution comes through as though it's science, right? But it's, we know evolution's a, it's really a religion, right? Or, or they used to, they like to use science and make it look like what we believe is foolish and, and is, non, is not science, but it's, it's merely a world view. And that's, and that's what we've been fed. That's what the world has pushed on generation after generation. And I dare say most of us in this room had experienced some of that as we made our way through, through the school system. Um, and it's just more so now. And um, so what, what we believe is looked down upon, like we're... Um, knuckle draggers, so to speak, and, and uh, not intellectual. Um, but we as Christians, right, we believe the Bible, and we look at everything, we listen to everything. Everything that comes through our mind is to be filtered and processed through the Word of God. Right? And so, the, the things of the world we know, we know that we're not good. Right? We know that we are born with a sinful nature. Um, when the world says, well, no, we're, we're good. We're basically good, right? And so um, when, we, when we come out against something or, or say, you know, we believe this is sinful or this is destructive to our society, right, what we are doing in love, in these rules, these boundaries that God has given us in love to protect us, these are viewed as hate, Right? And we've seen it, right? We've seen that love, what is loving, what we would call loving, is now viewed as hate. Um, and so, you can see we, we have this great conflict. And we are trying to raise our kids in it. Right? And it's a, it's, it's a heavy lift because the tide is against us, right? It's, um, 
I'll just say, like my father always says, I'm glad I'm not raising kids today. And you know, it's because it is. It's it's just a lot harder. Um, and the the warfare is greater. So this isn't just for moms. This is like the dads, grandparents. This is what we're up against, and it's for for our kids' sake. Um, and in in its the fallen nature of our society is, is, is it, it's progressively gotten worse. Um, in well, we we can start back in the '60s, you know, when when prayer was taken out of school. But it's 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 been decades, right, that this has been going on. And you know, and some of us remember uh, a safer time, a, a happier time. And we we were reminiscing in the back this morning in, in conversation when we could go out and play, and no one would bother us, right? Unless you're messing up, because anybody's mom could whoop you, right? And that's the way it was. And then they call home, right? When it used to be on the wall, and then you could get a whoop when you got home, and. But that's how it was. Though there were barriers that were put up, and those, as a kid, seemed harsh. But that was safe, right? Those were uh, means to keep us safe. Um, is it, well, I, I considered it a fortress, and to me, it was almost like there's layers of this fortress as I consider my childhood, and that. If anybody were to, to to harm you as a child, there were consequences. Like I, I I remember some older teens, young adults messing with me, and I was like eight years old, and my dad and they her dads took care of it. I don't know what happened. All I know is that I could walk from the house to the store without being bothered anymore. And but that was the world, right? The the authorities, the ones we looked up to, had our best interest in mind, and they were aggressive about it, whether it was society or us as individuals. They poured in, they did the hard things that allowed us to stand. But now, I see, I see this eroding of, of, of this wall, these walls, right? The, the attack on the family has been brutal. Um, you know, the, the, the abortion, right? The leasing, leading cause of death in our country, you know, the, the womb should be the safest place, and it no longer is. Um, but the division in family, the breaking up of families, and what that leaves for our, for our kids and the, the challenges that brings. You know, we're very much into this, you know, redefining of marriage and the, the division of genders and the roles and purposes in society and gender confusion and basically the, some of these things is normal, trying to normalize sin and others. There are things where there are, there are real problems that people had and they need help. But our society is like, no, let's push this all on and this is all accepted. Right? This is all good, it's all good. This is humanism. And we know that those things lead to destruction. Those things lead to harm. And I know even talking about this, probably uncomfortable, right? Because where society says that we don't care. But that's what we face. In, in, in raising our kiddos and our grandkids. Um, and you know, for your single moms, I applaud you. Um, it's a heavy lift. Just even in that, the world, our society, has shunned moms, has shunned women. In, in, in something that I believe, you know, was it started out as good, right? We'll, we'll call it women's lib, we'll call it whatever you, you want to call it, but the things that were implemented to make life better for women and to recognize women for who they are and have the same freedoms, all these things in our society, but then was taken to an extreme, right? And so now we've got this division where this conflict amongst genders, 
right, to the point that women, again, these are generalities, just it's not everybody this way, but as a society, women look poorly on men, and men look poorly on women, to the point that, like, men don't want to get married. They don't want because society has, has shunned the things of, of men as though it's, it's all wrong, it's all wrong, it's all wrong. And, but the two bring balance, right? Sometimes we just need one antenna and sometimes we need a radar dome. And, and that's how God designed it. And that's what makes families work. And uh, so yeah, the, the, the war rages on and you know, a society is only as strong as its families. You know, it's very common to us. Like, we, today we're going to go home, we're going to celebrate our moms, we'll probably hang out as family, and we, we, we just kind of do our thing, but it's under the heading of family. But it's the accumulation of strong families are what makes a strong society. And moms, you are the ones who get that done. I, and, and I'm not downplaying the role of men in the dads, because dads you certainly do, and, and it's oddly enough we have greater influence, even though we're not nearly as dialed in as the moms. But, and that's influence for good or bad, mind you. Um, so, back to the weight, because I think you all know it, right? As you look at your kiddo, as you look, you, you, you see the long game, you see you're trying to build a good human. But that's reality, it is, it is our job. And this worldview has wreaked havoc on our families. And those walls are very thin, are very thin, are very thin. In some areas, transparent. Um, some something as thin as a digital. I don't know what you'd call it, a filter on what is allowed into your homes. Um, but this battle has made its way. It was family, and it was it was grown ups, and these things that are going on. But now it's to our kids. I don't mean to freak everybody out and all this, but this is the reality. The war is against our kids, and it has been for a while. And that's why they, our kids have us to stand. And it's not just, I, I keep saying kids, but any kid that you influence, that you have influence over, any way that you care for, because grandparents, you are huge, 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 and all this. The stand you take, what you plant, what you water, and these kids last, and I think we all could. We could all talk about our grandparents, and we can remember things that they said to us, that affected us, that they changed us, that have made us who we are today. And likewise as parents. So don't under, in, underestimate your power, your influence. It's about intentionality uh, in that regard. So with that, happy Mother's Day. Isn't that joyous? No. It, uh, yeah, I probably wish that was all it was. Um, and again, I'm, I don't, hopefully this isn't coming as like, just this me mega bummer. Um, and again, more of a, a, a sobering, but, uh, but God doesn't make, he doesn't, there's no accidents in God's economy. And so in light of all this, in light of all this heaviness, it can be overwhelming, it can be discouraging, Moms, God gave you the kids you have because you were the perfect one for them. There's no coincidences in God's economy. He chose you to be the mom, the child. 
I chose you to be the grandparent, step parent, whatever the case may be. So he's called you and he will equip you and he will strengthen you. And, um, and again, it is a long game. Sometimes it takes a long time to see the fruit. But I encourage you to be transparent. I encourage you to be real with your kids. Let them see you work through struggles, through hard things. Let them see you pray. Let them see you forgive. Let them see you seek forgiveness and it be forgiven. Because we're preparing them for a world that's harsh, that views things totally different. And Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the rock. He is the truth. And our kids need to know that. I think many of us too growing up, we went to church, but it was religion. Right? We did good things. We, going to church was a good thing. We might give some money. We might serve in something. But it was very horizontal. Trying to make God happy. Try to make me look like a Christian, maybe. That does not hold up in this world. You'll raise your kids... They'll go to uh, it's high school, college. They're going to be attacked. The truth will be attacked and it will be mocked. The kids need to see it lived. They need to bring them alongside. Because strangely enough, we think we have to be perfect for our kids. They're smarter than that. They know better. But they're very gracious. Right, so our shortcomings, the things we do wrong, we don't get it quite right. Kids are quite gracious, willing to forgive. So in this, we need to lead them to Jesus over and over and over and over again. And remind them of his love for them. Over and over again. His love is greater than our love, which is hard when you consider your kid and how much you love them and what you would do for them. And God loves them more. So what better place to take them over and over again? Make them aware of the calling that God has on them. Even as kiddos, even very small There's a plan for their life. There are no accidents. And there's a mission for them. Their life has meaning. Their life has purpose. Expose them to that. Because in that, we can find purpose. Right in the hard things of the day. And the kids need it. We all need it. Um, Moving on to verse 8. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chef of the eunuchs that he might not, the chief, sorry, the chief of the eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. So to stand, back to Philippians 4.1. So Daniel purposed. Right, he made a decision. Very intentional. Before this happened, he chose who he was, who he served, what he would be. And in that, he was, he was able to take the stand, right? He was able to stand up because he had chose beforehand, and I would dare say it's very safe to say that he had parents that were very invested in him. That we, and, and we know in, 
Jewish tradition, you know, that what their life was in the, the sacrificial system and the temple and the Passover and the things that went on in the home, you know, that there was a constant, you know, they were instructed, you know, whatever you're doing, always bring up the Lord. Um, he observed them walking their faith, living out their faith. But then if we move back to today and today's family, what does today's family look like? Right? It's pretty fragmented, right, as a whole. Right? If you go if you go out and I gotta say I'm guilty of this. I just went out to eat with my wife the other night and I had to buy a birthday present. I shouldn't have to, I got to buy a birthday present. I'm like, oh, I gotta do that right now and I'm supposed to be on a date with my wife. And I'm sitting there shopping and getting a gift. And, but we see that over and over, right? We go, like, I remember watching a prom thing going on and the, everybody's coming in and all this and all the kids are on their phone. Like, there's, there's like, no engagement. Um, unless there's a selfie or something. And but that's kind of, the families are becoming, we're a family, but we're just units, independent units. Um, and um, that relationship building uh, isn't there. There's, there's so much distraction. And, and, and I just say life is busier than it used to be. There's a lot more expectation. And it's harder to balance all that. Um, my parents, we got one job. is to raise our kids and lead them to Jesus Christ. And that's primary. And I know that's tough. I struggle with it. Trying to, trying to find the balance. But that's our job. So those things in and of themselves aren't wrong. The phone, the tablets, you know. But they certainly bring a distraction and they're a pipeline into a, our kids that it's hard for us to manage or govern. Because going and reflecting back, some of you may remember, like, like we didn't have phones. We played board games. We played marbles on a long trip we didn't get to watch a movie or whatever it's play like the license plate game i spy right and is that anybody remember those things or the if i speak to you again i'm going to stop this car and beat you right <laughs> i got some of those right and we didn't but we we didn't necessarily enjoy it as kids but it's those things that nurtured that family, that togetherness, the, the, the distraction is not there. Um, and it's, it might seem simple or foolish, but having a meal together. Moms, if you can make that happen, it's going to be hard to get your husband to do it, but rein him in. The time at dinner is rich, not only as parents, but for kids. That time with mom and dad, with siblings, a very, very simple thing to do, but very, very powerful. Because all that time, you don't realize that you are pouring into your kids, not just physical food, you're pouring in spiritual things. You're filling their, their love tank, if you want, if you will. You're engaging what's going on with your day. Right? You're not allowing this space to get between you and whatever they're dealing with. And that's what they need from us. Right? I'd say now more than ever, we need to be in the mix. We need to be knowing what our kids are doing and what the influences are. And it's, a lot of it's as simple as sitting and eating dinner together. Not only that, it'll save you food budget. But, um, and of course praying. Praying for them, praying with them. And this is something as I've gotten older, I don't know if it means more to me or I understand it more.
but praying for your kids, praying for your grandkids, for the kids that you have influence over, they may never know. But it is tremendous as you, you seek, you approach the throne of God on behalf of your kids. Because there's things they're facing. There's things they're going to bring to you that you don't know how to handle. They're dealing with things that we never, it was never on our radar. We never heard of it. The enemy is aggressive. But our means are the same. And we serve the same king as one years ago. And he is almighty. He loves your kids more than you do. He will certainly hear your pleas. He will certainly hear your cries. This generation needs it. They need us to stand up and to, to do these things. And I, I was in a conversation several weeks ago and this person had shared being with their grandmother and what stood out to me in that is she's like not only did I know she loved me but she wanted me like she wanted me to be there and this really stuck with me here for a bit what a gift to give our kids Right, and all the madness of life, and all the busyness, all this is going on, all the things that distract. Because a lot of things we do for our kids, they don't necessarily see it as, they just expect it from us, right? Because your mom, your dad, and then always a ton of gratefulness. And, but what a gift. As parents, as grandparents, they were in your presence, they know they're wanted. Not just love, but wanted. But then as we pause and we look and we consider what the kids are dealing with today, the statistics, the weighty things that kids are thinking about or pondering or considering today because there's a world that's turned it upside down and has made what doesn't matter, matter. Right? So many kids are performers. Right? Before the world, with whatever app they're using, I'm not savvy in all this, but their acceptance and their value, their being wanted, is weighed on this. And this, and much of what comes through it, does not care about your kid. It actually seeks harmful things. This is a weak foundation. It's a very weak foundation. Our kids need Jesus Christ. They need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's our job. And we can be frustrated with our society and we can get angry, as we should. But if you want to change the society, if you want a strong society, be a faithful mom and dad. And grandparents, jump in. Is that my time? I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> but it, it works. I've got three more pages and we won't get to them. <laughs> um, so by no means am I saying that we need to barricade our kids in and have these walls, right? They need to be brought out to be able to live in this world. Our job is to equip them. These young men we just read about were teenagers. They're 14, 16 years old. And they stood against the greatest power of the day. 
They stood on faith. They were principled. They had made a choice to stand for God and what they knew was right, what they knew was true. And it affects us today. Your kids are no different. I don't care what age they are. They can be just little toddlers and they can proclaim the things of Jesus Christ. The songs that they sing when they're out about. I know it blesses me when my kiddos and they start singing worship songs and all this and we're in the market or whatever. But yes. Right? Because what comes from the heart. I mean, it comes out of the mouth is what's in the heart. And uh, so we, we need to be about planting those things. So we equip them and not to be ambassadors for this world as was the end game of what we read today or their intention but to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And I know that we can do this. Right? We can invest in our kids and we can teach and train. It doesn't mean they're always going to go that way. Right? Or sometimes they got to take a road to reinforce. But if they know the truth, right? This is train up a child, right? They'll come back, right? The prodigal son, he came back, right? But the cool thing about the prodigal son gets the attention, but the dad, the dad was present. The dad was waiting for his son, certainly praying for his son. And we can do the same. Go to battle, wage war for our kids, for our grandkids. So, hopefully that wasn't a total bummer for you moms. It, um, hopefully it was a charge to continue what you're doing or maybe up your game. A reminder that there's one who seeks to destroy your children. But you serve a mighty warrior. You serve a mighty God. Who can take great care of your kiddos. So let us pray. Father, um, much of what we see today is disturbing. It's frustrating. It's hurtful. And something is overwhelming. And Lord, these things can cause us to doubt, cause us to wonder where you're at. But Lord, in your goodness, you have, it's written that these things would go on. And these, these are the consequences of sin. This is the fruit of sin. But Lord, in this, as you did Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Lord, you... Equip them, you strengthen them to stand and then use them. So may it be so for us, may it be so for our kids. For we do not know what you have in store for them or what great things you might do through them. So Lord, bless, bless your people. Bless my time gathered as family. Lord, may it be a reminder of your goodness. Have your way in each heart here, Lord. May we learn, may we grow, may we be more like you. Amen. Have a blessed day, church.